Can we please stand for the receive stand for the pledge of allegiance. You can stay seated if God. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before the uh, roll call, I'd just like to say welcome to everybody. I think it's been since March that we've seen a lot of you. Uh, welcome. Glad you came tonight. And uh, I am assuming that we have the roll call taken care of? All right. Uh, can we, anybody want to move the, move the agenda? I'll move. And a second? I'll second. Okay. And uh, if anybody had a chance to, approve, to read and approve the minutes for 315, that would be March. 15th. Yeah, that'd be Can funny. I get somebody to move them? I'll move them. Second. And the second? Second. Any, any discussion on those? All right, those are, those are the presentations. Uh, we have the Ravine Regional Park hunting presentation from Washington County. Hello, Mr. Chair, uh, Commission, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Dan McSwain. I'm a natural resource coordinator with Washington County Public Works, and I'm here before you uh, to <laughs> discuss this proposal uh, about deer management within Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park. And with the presentation, I'm gonna go over the goals and objectives of why deer, we're proposing deer management within the park, uh, look at the monitoring of go, dating back to 2017 when we started doing aerial surveys of the park, uh, and then look at the proposal uh, the details, and then uh, look at the park impact and answer any questions that you have. Also with me tonight is um, uh, two uh, people from Metro Bow Hunters Resources Base, uh, Deb Luzinski and Mike um, Clarich, and they can answer any questions that you have when it comes to uh, the proposed logistics. Okay. Um, deer management goals, why are we proposing this? Uh, to reduce excessive browse, reduce vehicle deer collisions on roadways, uh, yet continue to provide for wildlife viewing and enjoyment by park visitors. Since a lot of people like to see deer in the park, we don't wanna completely get rid of them. Uh, and then the most important one is collaborate with local communities. Uh, deer management is a local decision. Um, high deer populations, low, medium, it's all about what the community thinks. So that's why we're in front of you tonight to uh, get your feedback uh, to see if this is a proposal we should continue moving forward with. Objective, what would we like to see when it comes to deer populations in the park? We'd like to see a population density of anywhere between 10 to 20 deer per square mile. And that's a recommendation working with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Regional Wildlife Manager for this region. So 10 to 20 is, they have uh, background research showing that those levels don't impact native plants that are within uh, these plant communities as much. If I may, what, uh, what, is, our, what is our population now per mile? Yes, Mr. Down. Chair, I'm, I'm gonna get to that in the next slide here. Right. So at hel helicopter, what have we been doing within the park? Um, dating back to 2017, uh, we started beginning aerial surveys. Those surveys were started after we received a three complaints in 2016 in the area regarding vehicle deer collisions. Uh, so when do they happen? They happen in the winter. You need sufficient snowpack. So you'll see in the data on the next slide that there's a couple years that are missing. It's just because we weren't able to fly at the right time. Um, and ideally, we're updating that count every other year. And then we use that to estimate the population, uh, the spring population estimate. So that's actually a picture of the helicopter in the air. Uh, when we're looking at population estimates, you'll notice Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park bolded across the middle. Um, in 2021, we counted 43 deer. And depending on how you calculate that habitat, so the park is actually about 0.8 miles of square habitat. And if you include to the south of 1061, it's a little bit more. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at there is that population deer per square mile can move a little bit, but it's still high. Um, the reason that we're also before you and also at, we're proposing harvest at St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park and Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park because Lake Elmo Park Reserve has a history of deer management over since 1993. 
So since 1993, um, there's been over eight shotgun harvests to help control the local deer populations. And um, part of me was wondering, well, okay, if we're gonna have a harvest up at Lake Elmo Park Reserve with lower deer populations per square mile, and we have higher at Cottage Grove and St. Croix Bluffs, we should at least have the community conversation about having a harvest. Uh, so this kind of shows a little bit of background of what Washington County has done throughout the regional park system. Uh, but note that no harvests have been done at Cottage Grove Avene Regional Park. So uh, the proposal that we have in front of you would be to have a archery harvest this year uh, in partnership with Metro Bowhunters Resource Base and uh, with two proposed harvest periods uh, between October 28th, 31st and November 12th through the 14th. So within the archery, regular archery, archery season. If you're not familiar with Metro Bowhunters Resources Base, it's a Twin Cities nonprofit. Uh, they part partner with local government agencies to conduct archery hunts on land where hunting is not normally allowed. Uh, hunters apply to the group and you, as part of your being able to participate in the harvest, you have to pass a proficiency test, which I'll get into a little more. Uh, and then they help coordinate the logistics of the hunt and then they help with the hunter orientation, which all hunters are required to attend and check in with the hunt coordinator, which for this harvest would be Mike. Oh. A little bit more about the details. Uh, for this harvest, uh, we'd be requiring a sharpshooter status, which is an elite archer. Uh, as part of that, they have to have seven of eight arrows in a four inch circle at 20 yards. So you have to be really good at, at uh, shooting archery. Um, you also have to be in elevated stands, so all shots are placed down to the ground, and there's a maximum 20-yard shot. Since we're also proposing this as a management tool, we're requ requiring earn a buck, and then again, those are the, the harvest periods. For those who are more icon-based, they're very experienced with other government entities, uh, Ramsey County, uh, they've partnered with Three Rivers Park District and many uh, cities throughout the metro. As part of this, there would be a substantial public notification process that goes along with it. So that includes press release, letters to neighbors, uh, so that we can meet one-on-one -on -one if anyone has any concerns. Uh, and then we post flyers and put uh, signs up during the harvest. Uh, for Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park, I have this map up to help visualize it a little more. Um, during the harvest, we're proposing to keep a majority of the park open while the harvest is going on, uh, while placing a 100-foot buffer next to all of our turf trails, paved trails, and then bordering the park next to our neighbors, having a larger no hunt boundary. So you'll see there's a substantial no hunt boundary on the southeast part of the park, as well as on that whole east side. Um, and May I ask you a question right now? Yep. If we're, if, if we're, if we're gonna do a 100 foot uh, hunt buffer uh, on the trails, why are we leaving the park open? Or why are you proposing to leave the park open? So, oh, so, so the, the buffer is a no hunt buffer. I understand that, but yep. if all the trails are closed, the park is basically closed. So, oh, why, so why it is closed the park. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry about that. Um, the trails will remain open. Most of the trails will remain open. Uh, some of these we could consider closing, like on the west side of Ravine Lake, there might be a stretch or two um, that we could consider closing, but for the most part, they would remain open with the buffer on it. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Not a problem. Um, any other questions anybody got for right now? Yep. I guess I have a, go ahead. Well, um, is it bucks only or is it any, any size or? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commission Member, uh, it is an earn a buck. So the, each hunter would have to shoot an antlerless deer uh, prior to harvesting a buck. And then they have to, uh, be within the DNR guidelines as far as limits go throughout the season. I believe this year, this metro area is at five for a overall limit. Okay, and then all the deer that are harvested, are they gonna be tested for CWD? Uh, C yeah, CWD? Mr. Chair, Commission Member, for this hunt, no. 
And, why I, and not why for would, any of the other hunts. Um, why wouldn't we do that? Especially just south of us, we've got a huge population. So why, and we're have you know an issue with chronic waste disease. Why would we not test these then? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commission Member, I can get back to. You. Is that okay if I get back to you on that question? We're actually working with them right now on a, a project up at Lake Elmo Park Reserve, so I can reach out to my contacts and get back to you. I think it'd be very helpful just from the standpoint of everything in the media right now with all these deer farms and that spreading. And it's, I'm, I'm an avid deer hunter, so I support the initiative, but I think we have an opportunity here if we're gonna do a focused hunt to also take some samples and see if we have anything here in South Washington County. Okay, thank you. If you have, if you have something that you can come up to the podium. Actually, I do. I do. Um, Come on up to the podium and state your name for the record. My name is Deb Lizinski. I'm the president of Metro Bull Hunters Resource Base. Uh, to answer the question about testing for chronic waste disease, we actually encourage it. So we have partnered with the DNR for many years. I remember back in, I think 2000 was the first year that we did, we actually tested at Battle Creek. So and that was when Lou Cornicelli was still at the Minnesota DNR. So we, we are all for it. We have actually, um, to some other preventative steps that we have taken as an organization is we have banned the use of any scents. So um, initially it was just any use of authentic doe urine. It's used to attract for those that don't hunt. Um, but not knowing how the prions are spread and knowing that those come from deer farms, we have banned the use of them. We did that several years ago. So we try to be exceptionally proactive Sorry, I was going to spit my gum on. I'm a gum chewer. I'm sorry. Uh, but we are, uh, excuse me, we are very much in favor of um, working with the DNR and testing for chronic waste disease. Uh, we actually ordered that. We had what, all hunts that were south of 94 last year. We did require it. So this would fit right in that parameter. And we could do it as well at, at Lake Elmo Park Reserve, St. Croix Trail, or St. Croix Bluff. So we're very much in favor of it. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions I can ask answer for you? Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a couple. One is I, I assume that you you mentioned um, St. Croix Bluffs just as a reference for us because we don't have anything to do with that, correct? Yes. And another question is is why what's the pros and the cons as to why you, you've gone with a bow only versus bow and rifle? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Great question. I, the amount of staff time required when it comes to a shotgun-based harvest is a lot. And the salt for getting management out throughout the park system, the archery is what would make the most happen. Um, for instance, on Lake Elmo Park Reserve, when we at last had the hunt in 2015, 2016, I fielded about 95 calls that I tracked. And I met with each neighbor because the shotgun is not safe. And many of them over the course, of, if, I, if I knew it was archery, I wouldn't have called you and had you met with me. So it's just the amount of staff time required. Also, the volunteers at Metro Bow Hunters Resources Base are great, as you can see with these two right here. Um, and then, so, so that, so staff time, but then also the recreational impacts that closing the harvest down has. Um, the last time we had the hunt, it was like 55 degrees on a November day. So everyone wanted to come into the park and, you know, most people are just staying on the trail anyways. So is there a way we can uh, work that out? And this was kind of the idea that we had. And typically for our park use, um, November is usually when it starts to drop again, right before snowfall. So that's why we were trying to target that November, late October, early November timeframe. I understand that, but my, I guess my concern, I guess I'll address this to public safety also, is that with leaving the park open, it's not so much worried about accidental people getting hit, but it's the, it's the, um, the effect that it may have if a child happens to see or a person that's very much against uh, harvesting sees an animal go down. Um, is, that an, is that something that we should be concerned with as far as the public safety side of it is about? Mr. Chair, that's a, that's a good question um, that I'm not going to be able to address adequately for you because okay. there is no easy answer. Um, that goes 
all the way along with roadkill hits, you could have the same effect. Because you don't do this hunt, you may have that uh, where you have personal injury or uh, property damage accidents that occur because we don't have a, a, a hunt in the area and we have to control the population. So there's, uh, there's many pros and cons to that. I think the limited number of people that are in the park and as long as the signage is appropriate, that people understand that there is an active hunt going on. And I think that's something that if the chair is so inclined with the council to ensure that um, the signage is appropriate for people entering, it's very, you know, it's, it's very clear that there is management of deer going on and there are active hunters in the park at the time and then the person can choose whether or not they want to stay and walk the trails or whether or not they want to not be a part of this system at that time for the small window that it's there okay um what kind of what kind of um notification i mean how far are you what kind of notification are you doing i, I know you said you're going to do a mass yeah. notification but that doesn't tell me what you're doing yeah uh, Mr. Chair, uh, one of the items would be the press release, and with that press release, um, typically the cities uh, pick that up, and I, I, with City of Cottage Grove, do you also send out email alerts to residents about upcoming projects or? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, um, typically for our press releases and notifications, it's like a 500 foot radius. So we can help produce like a mailing list. And typically it has all been mailings, but we do other work with our communication staff, you know, through Facebook and things like that. Um, that I'm sure we could partner with. My question was, my, I guess my question would be, if we do a 500, 500 uh, foot radius, we're gonna get the five people that live over there and the two people that live over there and everybody here at City Hall and that's about it. So I, I don't, I, I guess before I, before I, ask that question is how how has it worked in other areas where you've had this where you've had this kind of a hunt during a, a peak season like this obviously it's a bull hunting season but it's also if if the if we get rains we're going to have a very colorful fall season mm -hmm. which brings up which, which always brings out a lot more people so how successful or how many problems have you had in other places doing this yeah mr chair um Going back to Lake Elmo Park Reserve with the press, so press release, uh, city send, sending out an additional email about the hunt, uh, upcoming hunt, uh, letters to neighbors. Uh, we post every, every kiosk, every trail. We put a notification that the hunt's going to be upcoming for people who regularly come. Uh, and then we also use the electronic signs to warn people two weeks before the hunt. So we have a, a mobile trailer that we bring out and then we can put up on major roadways uh, so that'll be uh, employed uh, and then outside of that I guess just to think about the new social media so next door uh, and all the other ones that out there that we have a communication specialist that I'll be working with to get the word out and uh, if you I could always reach out to you or would it be appropriate if I re I maybe I could work with mr. chair is it okay if I work with Ryan on absolutely, absolutely. on that Certainly, come on back up to the podium. With the other municipalities that we work with, um, as an example, Ramsey County, Ramsey County puts it on their website. They put sign out, signs out at every legal entrance. So there are signs warning of the hunt dates itself that state there will be an archery hunt in progress on these specific dates. And the, as an example, Battle Creek is closed. You know, it's one of the biggest it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday deer removal. I think I've run that one for about 17 years myself. So every legal entrance is posted, and you know park users are warned that this that there will be a, an archery hunt or deer removal in progress during these times. But again, it's on Ramsey County's websites. Um, I believe that Three Rivers Park District does the same thing. Every mun mun municipality that we work with, that is typically how they they do. I don't even know if they send anything out to residents anymore. Like actually in the mail, everything is just either electronic, online. Do you have any? Do you have any figures on what the what the complaint level, if if there is any, um, in these other places that you had these hunts? We typically, at least my experience has been, and I've been with the base since I believe 1994, which is the year after its inception, or the first year of its, you know, real program, um, and I think. For us, it's, it's John Moriarty with Three Rivers Park Districts, 
he was in charge of Ramsey County for a number, number of years before he switched. He'd be the best one. I can get that information for you. I know Mike Goodnature, you know, I think the, primarily the complaints that we have are from the park users that, and I know you asked about numbers. I can find that out. Well, I, I just want to know if, if the, yeah. off the top of your head, you don't need to go in. No, and I, and I don't know that. I just know that, you know, there's a lot of people that become unhappy if, if you're breaking the routine. So even though it may be three, and again, these parks, this park is going to be open. You know, and our hunters also, when, when our hunters set up, it's, you know, not on a trail. If you want the, you know, because a deer gets shot, it's got to be field dressed. You know, we can bury the entrails, things like that. And to answer the question about damage, what it can do to a child that might see it, it struck me when I was actually at Crosby doing, you know, assisting with that hunt. And I was sitting close enough where I could see the big metal gate and the warning signs. And I watched a woman with what was probably a five or six year old kid bike down. And the woman stopped, read the sign, I'm watching him. You know, and I've got a little button buck or a, um, actually it was a spike because I didn't shoot him, standing in front of me. And I'm watching him. And I'm watching the woman read the signs, takes her bike, lifts it over the gate, does the same thing for a daughter. They bike in them. I mean, they're probably 60 yards from me. And I'm watching them admire that deer. And it struck me how damaging that could be for a child. You know, I have two kids of my own. Granted, they're 20, you know, three and 25, and they're bow hunters and bird hunters and all those other things. But a lot of people aren't brought up with that. They don't understand that that's where their food may or may not come from. But I think as our volunteers are aware of that, they're you know we're hyper aware of how we look to the public, and we don't we don't want to live a we don't want to leave that kind of impression on someone. Okay. You know, but it really, damn it, that struck me. You know, watching that kid, I'm like. What if I didn't see them? And I shot this deer. And it would be damaging. I think it really would be. But that's, I can't lie and say, no, it'll be fine. Everybody loves seeing that stuff. They don't. So, but our, our volunteers are very aware. And also we talk about proficiencies. I'm gonna, can I touch on that for a minute? Sure. Also know that the hunters that would be drawn for this hunt, Mike Clarich is a fellow board member. I've been with the base for a very long time. Firefighter, EMT. You know, so he's safety and all those other things. But he would also require these hunters, because it's a different area, it's our first time here, to take an additional proficiency. And that's done with their broadheads. So it's something that's done one-on-one -on -one or in a, actually in a group setting, so we'd be at Lake Hunter <coughs> doing it. Because um, we also do that for a couple other hunts. Mendota Heights is one of them. Because we're in Mendota Heights in West St. Paul as well. Sunfish Lake in West St. Paul. All right, well, so, thank you for your candor. Yeah. Safety for our hunters. Because as long as I get this, to, to yeah. on, touch on the fact that you won't get complaints all the time, and actually have support too. Oh, we do. People want us out there sometimes too. So. People like their hostas. I'm sorry, like their. I what? said people, like, homeowners <laughs> like their hostas. So we and we do. We you know there are the, there are those that complain, but there's we do have a lot of support. Good. We okay. do have a lot of support. But as far as if if I may just. The safety of our hunters also is exceptionally important to us. So that said, you know, every hunter is required to wear a five-point safety harness. That means five points of, of contact, right? Every single time they're in their stand, they have to. Everyone has to hunt from an elevated stand. There's no shooting from the ground. There may be shooting from the ground if there's a deer that has a less than perfect shot put on it because things do happen. There's, there's no fail-safe. There just isn't. It's hunting. So that is a... It's just the fact that it could happen. So in that case, it would typically be a coordinator that would, you know, manage that and take care of, to make sure that that animal is dispatched. All right. Well, thank you for that information. Yeah. Follow-up questions, maybe yeah. be able to answer. So, typical deer hunting archery is all camouflage. Absolutely. Um, are yes. they going to be camouflaged or any bright orange to identify them? No. Orange. Walking in and out of the woods. Because it's not a firearm. I'm sorry. Yeah. I can it, yeah if, if it were if, if it were in a firearm zone where where guns are used then they would be they would be required to and but then because, same same hunting hours then 30 minutes before sunrise and 30 minutes after sunrise half hour before, yep half hour before sun, sunrise and half hour after legal sunset and in this big of a park have we identified maybe some strategic areas where deer that have been harvested could be pulled out or are they going to be pulled out of anywhere within the park? depending on where they were harvested. And that's something that Mike can answer. Yeah, and Mr. Chair and Commission Member, we didn't want to get too far ahead of this on, on, the, on that type of detail of before getting your buy-in 
with the harvest. So we can, that's something that we'd be looking at. We, the next step would be developing signage communication plan. Look at that, where can someone drive down a trail if they have to? Is there a trail that we can close? Is it really necessary to keep open? So those would be the, the next steps okay. uh, when it comes to that. And then my, my final question then is, maybe I missed it, but the, the, the venison that's harvested, is it donated or what, what happens with, is hunter keeps their own kill? No, be, because if it were before season or after season, then it would be donated. Because we have done that in the past as well, where we have you know, a deer removal. I, don't even, I, I don't, typically don't even call them hunts. I call them deer removals. So from our perspective, we go in and we have a job to do. It's, you know, it's great that our hunters are, you know, have some kumbaya moments, but we're there to do a job. But to answer your question, no. Since the hunters are using their own tags, you know, they're not, they're purchased, and so they are able to keep their own. Okay. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And then last, this is not a question, more of a comment, because I only live about a couple miles away, so we're able to walk to the park. And I can just tell you, I listen to the coyotes every night. So I'm, I'm kind of shocked that we have too many deer. I thought the coyotes would be taken care of, but I'd actually recommend if you can take a coyote too, you're okay by me. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, what are you, are you looking for a recommendation from us tonight? Yeah, Mr. Chair, there, there was uh, one item um, that we wanted, and I thought that we included that in the agenda packet, but it was inclusion in the uh, the map for this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second one that wasn't in your agenda packet, but wanted to bring forth to you is wondering if uh, the commission would be able to pass a motion of support or a res resolution of support. Actually, a motion of support would be adequate if, if you would be willing. Okay. Uh, I only have one other question. Since this is in Washington, since this is a Washington County park, um, obviously you're with the county. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I'm assuming that the county is, is 100, 110 or 100 percent behind this, behind this whole thing. Okay. Correct. Yep. Um, that's all I have. Anybody have any other questions? Well, I'll certainly move the motion to pass a resolution to support the um, strategic hunt. We have a motion on the floor. I would second that. And we have a second. Any further discussion? I guess the only discussion that I would like to maybe have you to include into this is that we um, uh, direct the Washington County staff to work directly with um, our public works people on this. Because so, otherwise it gets too involved to get us back and back and forth. And Ryan, Ryan and his staff know, know what, we, what we're looking for. And, um, I think that would be the most efficient way to do this. Sure. Do you want me to amend my motion to include I, that? I would. Okay. Then I'll amend the if motion. If you want to, you don't have. No, to. no. I I certainly think it's a great idea. So I'd I'd be uh, amend my emotion my my emotion my motion to um, approve the uh, proposal for the strategic hunt with the stipulation that we Washington County work with staff moving forward. We have an amended How second. How about an amended second? <laughs> we have an amended second also. Any further discussion from anybody? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Good luck. Yep. yep. Next on the agenda, we have under new business, the hunting map um, from Deputy Director Renzel. Chair and Commission, uh, we're gonna go over something that we didn't discuss at all, which is the designated hunting ordinance. <laughs> so we just kind of pigtail into this. Uh, this came about uh, about the same time um, <coughs> as it normally does. We're going ahead with moving this today because of the Washington County presentation that went on, so we figured it would be the best time to go through it. So I'm not going to do a presentation for you today. I included it in the packet, and you have uh, copies of that with you. Um, as you can see with my memo, um, we had no complaints on hunting for the last two years in a row, which is absolutely phenomenal, um, something that we haven't had uh, in years past. As you can see the graph, um, we kind of had heavier in 2010, 11, 12, 
and then they kind of tapered off. And a lot of those hunting complaints that we got were really river related for bird hunting uh, along the river bottoms or along the river towards Great Cloud Island. And that's really been the crux of our major uh, issues. We passed an ordinance in 2005, uh, changing it to what it is currently, and it's really worked out well for us. So we really are not recommending any changes to the ordinance. I will say that we had a gentleman that had um, called and uh, was looking to amend the bow hunting to less than five acres. Um, we discussed it kind of thoroughly amongst ourselves and we were gonna look at changing it. However, his acreage did not get to five acres when it was included with another property. So his wasn't gonna be included if it was changed. So he uh, chose not to uh, come to the commission to speak to them about that. Um, our hunting ordinance is uh, really kind of the best case scenario uh, and it's comparable to other organizations or other cities within our area. Uh, the one was uh, Invergrove Heights that had a difference that allowed numerous parcels to make up five acres to hunt. I worked with planning and GIS to see what that would do to our map and it it really gets into a fuzzy area because you could take three areas in a residential zone and make it five acres. Um, which we don't want. So we really have the map set to how we, we really think it's the best uh, for the community. So we are not recommending any changes. Uh, with the maps that I've attached, as you can see, there are a couple of changes. I'll go over the uh, um, firearm change, which is one, and that is uh, east of Ideal, south of the new 105th when it goes into 110th. Uh, the city is in uh, negotiations or has already purchased property for a uh, new newer, um, water treatment facility in that area. So we removed that uh, in advance of that uh, hunting season because we know there's possibility of work getting conducted. So that parcel was removed from both archery and firearms. Um, the fire or the archery map itself, there's too many developments to name on the north side of town. If you haven't noticed anywhere north of 65th uh, along the border from the east all the way to Keats, there's been a number of developments. So almost all the parcels were removed with the exception of, um, I think there's three parcels left. And I think of the three parcels that are remaining, one probably will remain in the near future. The other ones I think will be sold to development within a next year or two. So. Uh, that map will change again next year. Um, other than that, the, the archery portion of the map has remained the same also. Um, but we continue to grow and develop, and then as the five-acre lots are uh, no longer available, then that uh, hunting is eliminated from that area. So uh, that's all I have. I'm asking for your recommendation. The one part of the packet that is wrong is I'm asking you to approve the 21 and 22 Map designated boundaries for discharge of firearms and archery equipment for hunting, not the 20 and 21. So that was the one typo on my, okay. my end. So I'll stand for any questions if you have them. Any questions at this time? Anybody want to move it with the addend with the uh, with the amended uh, changes? So I'll move the motion with the amended um, changes. And I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I lost my screen. I don't know where we're at here. You got yours? Yours is doing the same thing mine is. Okay. Thank you. Favor always works. Uh, do we have any response? Any previously raised commission requests? Seeing none, any commission comments and requests? Anybody have anything? I do. Okay. About Jamaica Avenue, you guys put new signage up and the stop sign went up on 100th and Jamaica. My question, I guess, is when you're coming down Jamaica, they made it a right turn only and a left turn. I'm just asking how come it's not a double right? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we did look at that because you're right. You've got two rights potentially in the two eastbound lanes. Um, the biggest reason is uh, a semi is not able to make the turn from the left lane fully into the outer lane going westbound. Um, it's just not possible with the way the 
roadway is set up right now, so they actually cut into the inner lane. So it's more of a safety thing if we had a semi in the um, left southbound lane and you had a car turn at the same time, they would actually travel over the car's path. So we did look at that because initially we thought, yeah, we could do two rights and the left, um, but more of that, probably a small chance of that happening, but we want to, you want to make sure any vehicle can make that movement. So gotcha. it's a good question though. Any other comments or requests? Hearing none, we'll move on to the updates. Public Works Open House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I can give some of our other updates as well. But the first one to talk about is we are doing our Public Works Open House again this year. We do that every other year. Um, last year was a regular year off, which with COVID, uh, we wouldn't have been had it anyways. But we had our last one in 2019. So looking to have that again this year on, uh, uh, should be Thursday, uh, September 16th. Um, September 16th? September 16th, yep. Um, we, uh, no, actually, sorry, we actually changed that. It's Thursday, September 23rd. Normally we do the third Thursday, but we thought that's getting a little close to Labor Day, um, given how that it plays out this year. So I think it's actually Thursday, September 23rd. Um, so looking to do some of the similar things, uh, public works and parks open house, um, getting a lot of vendors in there, getting the 49ers union down with some of their training equipment, you know, letting, uh, kids come in and see our big equipment, bucket truck and loaders. So bring back a lot of that fun stuff. I know it's well attended every year. I think we had probably about 1300 people um, last year attend. And then during the day, we're gonna do some stuff for staff over lunch too, to let them come down and see what we do down in public works. Got a lot of new staff in the city over the last two years. So excited for that, but wanna to talk to the commission, see if you had interest in kind of joining in that night um, in terms of some of the helping out. You know, we have different tables and stuff, handing out information. So. I think in past years, some of the commission members have come down and helped out with that. Um, it's usually from about three to seven. So I wanna see if you had interest again this year and we can kind of work and send out more information after this on specific times, but. Well, speaking just for myself, I like to talk to people. So I, I, I'm, all, no. I'm all, come on, Bob, be nice. Yeah. You, you can um, work the main, the main entrance, you can, well, <laughs> the main greeter. No. I don't wanna scare them all the way. Yeah. I wanna get in first, then we can talk to them. Yeah. But no, I'm, I, I have, I've always, I, I know that we've always done this in the past. Mm -hmm. um, we've always helped out and we've had uh, pretty good attendance, I think, from the, uh, from the commission. And uh, uh, if you want us, um, at least I'll be there for sure. Perfect. And if I can flatten Bob's tires on his truck, it, well, he'll have to come because he won't have nothing to do. Oh, that's good. And we can, like I said, we can send out an email to folks maybe here in, in August as we're kind of wrapping up the planning right now. So. We can send out an email, specific times, the date, and um, see who wants to kind of sign up to be there. So, the only the only request that I would have, and I made it last time too, and I don't know if it went anywhere, is that if you're going to put the displays back into the um, cold storage area there, the big the big bay, yep. Don't put the bounce houses in there with those big fans because you just can't hear nothing else. No All the noise. Else. Yeah, it it drives the people out, and it uh, it's kind of hard to have a conversation with them. Oh, that's so good to know. We, we did, Mr. Commissioner, we brought it outside. And it was, it must not have been there the last one we had. Uh, we did bring them outside. It was a great comment because numerous people commented on how noisy that was. We even tried insulating the, the blowers, if you remember right. So they are sitting right outside the big bay now. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Well, more, more to come on that. Like I said, it'll be, it'll feel pretty similar to other years. I think people really like it. So we didn't want to make major changes, but we'll send out more info here in the next month or so. All right. Uh, other than that, um, for other updates, obviously still very busy in town. Um, lots of development going on. Um, I think talking to planning, it's up to about 750 lots that are being developed this year um, for new homes. Above what we normally that is, yep, okay. yep, yep, and that's not homes built, that's kind of lots being developed ready for homes. Um, so far, we're at about, I think, almost 300 new homes this year through the end of June. Last year, we had 380 for the year, um, and I know back when I started in 2013, you know, we had 40 that year, so. So it's, with 300 new lot. homes at the cost of lumber, that's more like 600 new homes. Then. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It is surprising with material shortages and things like that, they're still chugging away, so. Um, yeah, lots of that going on. Um, weather's always been favorable for construction, not so much for other things with no rain, but 
with no rain. I know they're making good progress and getting utilities and streets and everything built. So other than that, for city projects, uh, Hamlet Park, our phase three of Hamlet Park is on just getting started up. Um, that's those two new ball fields we're building kind of on the south end of the park. Mm -hmm. um, that'll wrap up this year. The ball fields were kind of developed last year and we're doing the parking lots and utilities this year to open everything this fall. So that's underway. Um, pavement management, of course, has been underway. Our chair is well aware of that as we're in his neighborhood. Uh, redoing the streets. Uh, pavement management's underway. So, yes, so you're getting to live that every day. Um, but that's, I think, overall been going pretty well. We are going to start work on Jamaica in August uh, from 80th to Indian. We're gonna redo, replace the pavement from 80th to Indian. Um, we're gonna flip traffic, close one side at a time and just have you know two-way traffic on one side of the median. So they'll always maintain access you know, during construction, just uh, flipping traffic from one side to the other. So that'll be a good project to get a pretty old main road um, redone. So I know we're excited for that and our streets crew are excited to not be patching there anymore. Um, other than that, our other big project that'll be starting up, it's called our South District Sewer. So Hunter Street right now is kind of the service boundary. We can't um, develop anything south of 100. So we're putting in a new, it's about a mile of pipe, 30-inch um, trunk sanitary sewer connecting into the Met Council line down on 3M property. So that project was bid out. Um, it's about $3.5 million to run from um, 3M property up to Ideal Avenue. So um, That'll be a big project that will get started here. You won't see much of it because it's almost entirely on 3M property, but they were good to work with to get easements and whatnot. Um, so that'll start August 1st. We had to wait till August 1st due to so some is this species. Gonna, is this dumping into, into the uh, Metro Waste or is it going or going into 3M's? Uh, this will go into Metro Waste. Yep, the Met Council it's sewer. Going 3M's property. Yep, 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 it runs through 3M property. Yep, so it'll go down to Eagles Point uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant down there on the Who's, river. Who was the low bidder on that? A uh, little bigger uh, bidder was uh, Geislinger and Sons, okay. so they'll be doing the work. But like I said, we had to wait till August 1st because of some um, uh, different species down in the wetland. So August 1st is what we're looking at for a start date. Okay. Uh, other than that, for public work standpoint, Streets has been busy doing their thin overlays. So we're wrapping those up in the next couple of weeks. I'm actually going to go out and join them tomorrow morning to see how everything goes with them. So. Um, that will be good. That's been occupying a lot of the summer. We have a new city forester who's going to be hopefully starting soon. Um, so that'll be, that'll be good. Ours moved on, got a, a new job um, promotion over in Anoka County. So um, we uh, have a young kid who we liked coming out of school. So I know our streets foreman, Mark Gorgas, he's been kind of the acting forester. So he'll be looking forward to that person to start. Um, other than that, utilities, you know, they're out on our construction sites um, all the time. So they've been really busy. Also, we're pumping a lot of water. Every day we're pumping a lot of water. We pumped over 12 million gallons one day in the end of June. That's more water than we've pumped since 2006 in a single day. So, Are we having any issues with that right now? We are not personally. Um, our water system is, is pretty good. We can pump to about 15 to 15 and a half million gallons in a day and keep up. Okay. Um, so that's not an issue. What we are watching pretty heavily is the state. You know, we're getting to that tipping point statewide where there's so much drought. Um, they're going to start mandating that cities do different things to try and cut back on water use um, on a statewide level. So um, we're watching that very closely because um, every Thursday there's a new drought update. And the one last Thursday was much more severe than the week before. So we'll be watching this Thursday pretty carefully. Like I said, at a local level, we can keep up. You hear some communities that haven't been able to keep up with the water demand around the metro, but we've been doing well so far. All right, thank you. I think that's everything for me. Uh, anything from public safety and or fire? I'll pigtail on his uh, water conservation. We actually were approached by the water department to assist with our few of our community service officers and reserves who are now deputized code enforcement. So they're going around actually doing sprinkler education and timing for uh, when sprinkling is allowed and is not allowed. So it's an educational process right now. And I think that's to ensure that we're doing our side uh, as a city to ensure that residents are being advised of the, the current state, which is odd and even, no watering on the 31st and nothing between noon and four. So they're doing an educational um, thing right now. So that's on, on a pigtail. Yep. Our people are assisting the water department and code enforcement, but they're code enforcement officers, not the police department. 
try to make that distinction, even though we get the complaints. Um, so as far as public safety goes, um, a couple of dates, key dates that are coming up. Safety camp is July 27th, and I think that's at Hamlet again. Station no, three. Station 3. Um, so that's a one-day event that changed a number of years ago from a three-day event down to a one-day event, and it's really almost exclusively run by uh, the rec department in Mali, and we just kind of assist uh, with camp counselors through the police and fire department. So we kind of took a hands-off approach to that. We we did a lot more of it in years past when we had somebody dedicated to community affairs on a on a daily basis. Now we don't really have that position as much. So Molly kind of took that took that over a number of years ago. So for that's those, the 27th. For those that don't know where Station 3 is, could we could Station we know 3 is? is out off of uh, Lamar and 74th? Yeah. 5th. You get there at 74th. 70. <laughs> 75th and Langley. 75th and Langley. Uh, and people that don't know, there's a nice skating rink out there, and that one's used. There's a Zamboni out there. So if people aren't familiar with parks, it's a good opportunity to go see a park you maybe didn't know existed. Um, so that, again, is July 27th. The next big one uh, for public safety is Night to Night is on, August 3rd. It's first Tuesday in August. Um, so we'll be cranking up the... Uh, the ATVs and the side-by-side -side and everything out and get out to all the parties. Um, our sports services uh, division has been working hard along with uh, Captain Martin to really get that off and running because we didn't know. Was it on? Was it off? Is it COVID canceled again or are we going to go with it? And we're going with it. So that'll be fun. We haven't had an opportunity to really engage with the community in a couple of years now uh, in that type of setting. So we're excited. Uh, as a public safety team to get back out there and talk to the residents and kind of get the pulse of the community on a face-to-face -face basis other than email and text messaging. I have, I have a question on that if with what's what's currently being being told to us on the through the news media um, is there a contingency for if they kick up the COVID restrictions? I think there's always a contingency in the back of our head. We still have our COVID-19 protocols and plans and we follow CDC recommendations. So if there's recommendations that come down from uh, centers of disease control or other local, um, we'll start to modify our jobs based upon those recommendations. But Minnesota hasn't had the uptick that other parts of the country have had. We've kind of stayed. There's been a slight uptick mm -hmm. uh, on the variant, but really Minnesota has been less uh, affected than other communities or other states, and Kent can probably speak yeah, for about 14 hours. 1.48% positivity, which are really low. Anything below 5% is... So, we're hanging in there. Yeah, we're doing a good job. Um, but again, Captain Martin's kind of our go-to. She's our guru uh, within okay. the community for emergency management and everything COVID. She just got back from Bemidji at the wildfire. She was up there on an EMAC request for over the weekend. She canceled her camping trip to go camping. All right. <laughs> I've got one other quick fires. question. I got one other quick question, and it's more directed towards uh, the chief, okay. fire chief. Did you get your reservations done this year? I don't want to see Pete <laughs> remanding you on Facebook again. We worked a deal. All right. Good. <laughs> um, Couple other things uh, going on at the police department. As you know, we had hired um, three new officers in the past. They're all on their own on solo patrol. Um, and actually, because of COVID last year, we didn't swear in the other three officers that we had hired. So we we're going to do a, a joint swearing in of six new officers uh, at the next council meeting, I think just before out on the patio in a more open, friendly environment. So the families get an opportunity to come in. Uh, that present the badge, the chief presents a badge, uh, kind of uh, that, that honor and integrity it carries and, and the trust that's bestowed upon them. So that's a good opportunity for the families to come and meet and then we get them around. So um, that's going to be a good one. Uh, that's coming up at the next council meeting. Uh, other than that, really, uh, the big trends that you're starting to see in the newspaper and you're starting to see pop up around, we're very well aware of. I think there was an op-ed article just written uh, by an ex-Hennepin um, County judge about police pursuits and how they happen and what's going on and do we make them more stringent, do we not? As you know, there was a fatality involving a, a squad crash in Minneapolis a few weeks back now. Uh, back now, you've seen us for uh, a carjacking incident, uh, use of a gun. So, you know, we're, we're, we're very well aware of it. We, we kind of have our pulse in the community, but I will tell you that... Um, Metro-wide, there has been a marked 
tick up of auto thefts, carjackings, and fleeing police in a motor vehicle. Um, so much that I actually did trends and, and looked at it. And, and so you know and, and have a, a level of understanding where we're at. We're at 18 um, vehicle pursuits that have been actually documented in the city of Cottage Grove. That's either us starting or assisting. Um, we had all of last year 15. So we're three above already from last year. And the majority of last year happened at the end of COVID. And this is a culmination of a number of things. Um, jails weren't holding people unless it was a person crime. Auto theft was not considered a person crime. Neither was fleeing in a motor vehicle. So we would literally arrest somebody for fleeing and release them because the jail wouldn't take them. So um, we have uh, our stats essentially are this year, half of our chases we've terminated on our own. So we talk about this in the, in the paper and when should we terminate, when shouldn't we? We have a whole litany of uh, policy within the policy of when you should terminate, the level of the crime, propensity of possibility of crash, the speed. Um, there's just a whole host of things that the officer takes into account uh, during a, the start of a pursuit and when to terminate. Anyone in the department can terminate at any time during that pursuit. So it's not just the driver, the supervisor, another person that sees something that's unsafe can call for a termination and we do that. So half the time we terminated. 30% um, of the time the person either stopped, crashed, ran into a field, we lost them for a minute, they got out and ran on foot. So that's another 30% of the time. And then uh, about 20% of the time we used what's called a pursuit intervention technique. So. If you see our cars, you see that the push bumpers kind of wrap around. Uh, that's a purposeful thing. We go through training every uh, four years to learn how to do this maneuver. And it's basically uh, to take a person that's driving and to take them off the road in a safe and effective manner in order to slow the speed or to stop the pursuit from occurring, okay? So there's speed parameters in which those uh, take place, but we really found that that's the safest uh, and most effective way we had one uh, earlier this year that this, the pursuit started, it lasted a block and a half in this first corner, he was pitted and taken into custody. I mean, you don't want the pursuit to get to 90 miles an hour. You don't want the thing to occur. Once it gets out of your control, essentially, you're really running a risk on what's gonna occur. Um, and I'll, and uh, so that's kind of our stats. Uh, the, another thing I'll talk about is the Minneapolis one is, they don't employ a Opticom system that we have in Cottage Grove. So the, the lights don't automatically get tripped green if you have an Opticom. It's a, it's a cost for every light we put them in. It's, they're not cheap. Uh, each one of them in our cars is about $500 and you're looking at 20 cars at $500. So those are purchased every probably six years or so. And then I don't know how much the Opticom system on the lights themselves are, but it's a portion that we do. Uh, it's an integral part of safety for emergency responders, whether it's police, fire, or EMS, to have that type of equipment. I'm very proud of the City of Cottage Grove for putting in all of that safety equipment that we have. So when we do do these um, things and people take us on these uh, pursuits, we try to do them as safely as humanly possible and, and, and take into consideration all facts. Um, so I just wanted to give you kind of an update. You'll see it in the paper. Know that we're on it. We understand it. We're, we're doing analysis is on it. And, you know, we, we talk to our supervisors on a regular basis at staff meetings to go over this type of information and then what it is that's important to the community and when it's not important to, to pursue a vehicle. Uh, sometimes it's better to catch them later. Sometimes we shut lights off and we use other resources. You see the last one, we're trying to catch up to him and it crashed on 70th Street at the overpass and he fled on foot, right? Some of these things are outside of our control and what we really have to do is we have to go back to the judicial system and, and the courts and, and make sure that these people that are doing these dangerous acts are held responsible for their activity um, and place blame where it really belongs. But also taking into effect that the police department has to understand there are limits to what we do and we understand them and we make sure we're trying to do the best for our community at all times. So just kind of a, that's where we're at with that and kind of give you an update because I know you guys see things in the paper just like we do. And uh, any of those things that come up, please feel free to contact us and we'll, we'll try to touch base with that. But that's kind of the latest trend that we saw 
an uptick on it. I wanted to keep you guys briefed. So that's it from public safety. I'll stand for any questions if you have any. Any questions of the deputy director at this time? Chair, I do have a question. Where are we with the uh, stealing of catalytic converters? Is that still uptick or is it? It is. It still is. Um, we just, uh, before I came in today, had uh, arrested someone that had a catalytic converter, a sawzall, and a floor jack in their car, but they were just helping a friend oh, okay. fix an exhaust. Um, so we've actually done really well. Our community um, does a very good job on seeing things that aren't right and calling us and allowing us to apprehend the people. So honestly, I think we've made five arrests at least for catalytic converter thefts. The floor jacks that are gonna go to auction, just if you're all interested, we do it at Cranky Ape, they're really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and the Milwaukee fuel stuff, the, the equipment these guys are using is top notch. It's better than anything in my garage, so I kinda wanna go to Cranky Ape. Um, but honestly, the, it's, it's amazing the equipment these guys have. And they're brazen to do it in the middle of the day. We had one that we arrested. Um, I actually happened to be in an area um, and their call came out and sure enough, they're at Planet Fitness, two o'clock in the afternoon, underneath the car, taking the cat off. And they'll cut them off and it doesn't take them more than a minute. They're in and out in less than a minute and they're on their way. And every time we've arrested someone, they've had multiple catalytic converters. Huh. And None of them have lived in Cottage Grove. So, well, I do have a I do have a sawzall and a floor jack in my car, but I think I will just not put anything else in there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it might take you more than a minute, Commissioner, to get out from underneath oh. there. So I think we're going to be safe with you. I'd probably need two jacks to get it up high enough. Is what you're trying to say. I, I understand that. No comment on that. <laughs> leave that one alone. Yeah, leaving that one alone. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Chief, you're up. Uh, good evening, Commissioner and uh, uh, Chair. Uh, the, uh, just a few updates in the fire division, uh, personnel-wise, on our paid-on-call side. Since the beginning of the, of the year, we've lost four paid-on-call personnel to job changes, family situations, and injuries. Uh, so it looks like we're going to be doing another hiring process starting in the, in the fall. And we're hoping that that's... Um, those that apply and make it through the process will be starting either on the department uh, as, as with their feet hitting the ground running in January of 22, or we're going to be sending them to school, one or the other. But we'll, we, we hope to be replacing those staff that, that have left. Calls for service since we've last uh, held a meeting together in March. Um, in March, we had 273 EMS calls. In April, we had 298. In May, we had 296. And in June, we had 326. So I think when we started opening back up the state uh, and starting to loosen our mask restrictions, our calls significantly jumped. I wouldn't say they were mostly COVID, but more people were out and about. We were able to, we were starting to get more calls. So for that uh, time frame, that was about 1,193 calls in that short time frame. On the fire side, we, we kind of fluctuated a little bit. In March, we had 46. Uh, fire rescue type calls. We had 89 in April, 70 in May, and 79 in June for a to total of 284. That's again about average of what we run for uh, for fire type calls and and rescue type calls. Uh, and some of those we hit, we did have some structure fires in there, and just a couple on this past July 4th that were uh, one was re related to a charcoal grill on a deck, and another was fireworks related. Is that the one in the middle of Jamaica? I went by that one when it landed and started the grass on fire. No, actually, uh, the- It wasn't me. No, <laughs> no, uh, this was in a residential area on the okay. second one. It was right after the city fireworks, okay. roughly at 10, 20, I think, in the evening as it occurred. Uh, some other items. Uh, I think I mentioned in, early in the spring that we were gonna get some older homes and uh, structures to burn, do some practice burns. Uh, so far, we've, we've trained in four of those structures. Uh, th three have been burned, burned to the ground, and it was excellent training. We actually had St. Paul Park and Newport come to one of those trainings as well. Uh, they had a lot of new staff, and so it was, it was nice for them. Uh, one, of the, one of the gentlemen from St. Paul Park had got on their department in 2019 and hadn't seen a structure fire yet. 
So his first structure fire was our training burn. So he was really excited about that. Uh, this was also a chance for all the staff that we sent through fire uh, instructor one course during COVID um, for them to get a, their chance in practice and being leaders on a fire ground and practice burns as instructors. So they, they needed to actually these burns to help get their certification. Uh, we have another one that uh, has not completely burned yet. We're working in conjunction with the State Fire Marshal's Office right now. We had uh, several staff go through investigation one and two for fire investigations, which was put on by the State Fire Marshal's Office at the Central Fire Station. So we set five burns in that uh, house next to the majestic ballroom that the city acquired uh, and is allowing us to burn down as well. Uh, that class finished up last week where they investigated those five burns and had to present their findings in the class. Our plan is to uh, do our final trainings on that on August 14th, which would be a Saturday. So if any commission members would like to come down and see how we kind of train on that day, ample parking over there um, by the Majestic Ballroom. We're hoping for nice weather and I'm hoping for a wind out of the north so it doesn't blow any smoke towards the residential areas. So uh, that will be probably our last um, live fire training burn of this year. We will have one more, it sounds like, in the spring out in East Cottage Grove. Um, we also have sent a, uh, one of our full-time staff members through a blue card training course. And what the blue card is, is it's a standardized course that uh, prepares people for uh, command positions, but also in, it enriches the department on nomenclature for fire, setting up command positions, and um, based on the scene activity of whatever it might be. So everyone is basically on the same page when they hear whoever the first arriving crew is and they give that update. So they kind of get an, an idea right away of what, what they should expect or what they need to do. Um, so we sent this um, staff member to this trainer course that was uh, reimbursed by uh, the state. Uh, it was a $4,500 week-long course that was put on. It's nationally recognized. So he's come back, and he has a lot of good ideas on how to get the uh, entire department, maybe not certified, but at least up to the minimum basics level. Of if they happen to be in charge of a fire, they can run the scene. So we're excited about that. And then lastly, um, we're scheduled to get an ambulance here at the end of the month. We're replacing a 2014 ambulance that's really nickeled and dimed us to death. Um, Public Works can't wait to get rid of it. It's really been an eyesore down there in the shop too. So uh, we're hoping to have that in service here by the end of the month. So we'll have um, two 2018s and a 2021 ambulance. So we should be good uh, for several years on that end. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything else in the fireside and I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Council comments. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners. Um, you've seen in the packet the minutes that we've had. You've heard a lot of what's been happening right here already. A lot of what we're working on is those developments, working through all of that. One of the big things that was in the, the two um, minutes that were in the packet had to do with community center as in the referendum question has been passed and we're moving forward with a referendum for the community center, which will be this fall. So um, the wording of that, I, um, I don't think you can see it right there in the packet, but if you do need more information on it, feel free to reach out. We'll certainly be happy to share that with you. Um, so those are kind of the big things. We just have tons of developments. We've had lots of workshops discussing those. Um, and so I'm not even gonna try to name them all because I know I will miss probably three-fourths of them. Um, but I don't know if any of you have questions or have questions about any of the different projects that are happening with some of those developments. Um, I'm certainly happy to try to answer some of it. And I know Ryan can help out here, too, um, with what's happening with some of those things. Anybody have any questions? I do. Yeah. How about air gas? Is that thing ever going to open? You want to take that one? It's been taking forever. <laughs> Yep, so air gas, I believe they are very close. Um, initially, yeah, it's been about, what, two years, I think, of construction. Um, I think their initial plan was to open this past spring. Um, it's kind of interesting, a lot of the equipment comes from France. It's pre-built in France, so I know COVID created some challenges for them. Um, and since then, it's just been a lot of uh, kind of final touch-up things, working with Excel Energy to get that big power line in there. So I think this fall, 
is when they want to get open and running. Um, there was a final building enclosure they didn't have for, they got big, big motors, lots of power they used there. So yeah, I think it, yeah, probably three to six months behind their initial date, but you're right. Good two year construction. Yeah, so. I drive by it every day and it's like, geez. Yeah, long <laughs> process. I have a question. Um, Michael's just putting that gas line down Point Douglas. Are they having trouble with that directional drill? They've been there a long time. Did they hit rock down at the other end? Is that what their problem is? I know they had some bedrock that they were working with. Um, you're right, down, you're talking on the far kind of northern, western end. Yeah. Yep. I know they had some bedrock they were trying to work around in groundwater as well. So I think that delayed some of the drilling at this point. Um, the open trench, that's been a pretty efficient crew. They've been working very, their way down West Point. Very efficient, very efficient. I just, I just, I talked to the drill guys here a while back and they said, yeah, they'll get about 200 feet a day. And yeah. by that time they should be in St. Paul by now, but. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're, they're really moving. Some drill, some rock or something there. Yep. And I know the other part was when they actually do some of that work on the far West end, there's some coordination with the railroad that they're having to do with the quiet zone and a short closure I know has been a bit of a challenge as well. So. Okay. Any other questions that you have? I'm just gonna make mention, thank you to the fire department. One of those structure fires was um, not my house, but the building I live in, I'm in a townhome, um, and it was one of the structure fires. So the team was excellent, um, and the coordination with um, some of our neighbors, um, it was quite, I'm not going to say fun to see, but very interesting to watch the coordination. Everyone there, how safety was at the forefront of everybody's, everybody's mind. So I know you guys know how great they are, but it was great to actually see it in action. Not because it was my, <laughs> my place, because that was kind of nerve-wracking, but uh, uh, thank you to your team. I, I don't think you were there that night. I think you were over at the park probably, or did you show up? Okay, I didn't see ya, but that's okay. <laughs> that's, you're, you're hard at work. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Um, thank you, commissioners. It's good to see you all in here too. I was gonna kind of piggyback on what Chairman said. It's nice to have every, see everybody in here. Uh, last time I think we were in the other room, so thank you. All right. Anything else before we adjourn? Anybody have anything? No. Okay. No. Uh, motion for adjournment. Got a motion? I do. And a second? Do we have a second? Second, yeah. second. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do we want to discuss it? Meeting's closed. <laughs>